Take note of Ben Vaughn. You may know him as a producer of artists such as Los Straight Jackets, Charlie Feathers, Ween, or maybe a weird one-off collaboration between Alex Chilton and Alan Vega, which he talks about in this episode of Berkeley Online's Music Is My Life podcast, which you are, of course, listening to right now. I'm your host, Pat Healy. Anyway, Ben Vaughn got his start as the leader of a group called the Ben Vaughn Combo in the 1980s and got a lot of attention from mainstream press and inspired favorable cover versions of his tunes by the likes of Marshall Crenshaw, The Plimsolls, Man or Astro Man, and more. His big break in the music industry came when he moved out to LA and quickly got a job as a composer for the show Third Rock from the Sun, which he composed the theme for and all of the other music, really. Success on that show led to a gig in the same role on That 70s Show and numerous other television shows. He has now comfortably resumed a solo career, and he also hosts a radio show on WXPN in Philly and online on Saturdays from 5 to 6 p.m. The show, like his first album, is called The Many Moods of Ben Vaughn. I found him in a mood that was both upbeat and reflective. Yes, it's possible to be both. I mean, the guy has many moods. As he explained where it all started for him. I'll let him tell you. When I was six years old, my uncle gave me a Dwayne Eddy album. Uh, we were visiting him at his apartment. He was a real rock and roll fan. And this is about 1962, I guess. And uh, we were visiting him. He was a bachelor. And he was a rock and roll nut. And he played this Dwayne Eddy album. It was called Twistin' and Twangin'. And it was during the twist craze. And I flipped out over it. And he took it off the turntable and gave it to me. And I probably played that record about 2,000 times, like literally 2,000 times, because it was the only record I owned. And uh, and also a moment that uh, my mom told me about recently, which I didn't remember, is that um, I was we were listening to the radio one day and a song faded out. And I asked why the band went away. And, and she said, oh, that's just a fade out. And I remember... And she said that I had this look in my eyes like, oh, you can manipulate things in a <laughs> studio? Wow. <laughs> I was probably, yeah, I was probably like seven years old at the time. So when, when did you uh, first pick up uh, guitar and drums and, you know, everything you eventually played? Well, I started out as a drummer when I was 12, I played in some garage bands and things. And then I wanted to write songs. And a friend of mine was a really great uh, rhythm guitar player. But he wanted to be a lead player, so he taught me how to play rhythm so he could practice lead. So he taught me chords, and we would get together every day after school. There was a department store called Corvettes in South Jersey, and they had a department up there, um, a music department that had sheet music and about five or six silvertone acoustic guitars, and we would take the guitars off the rack and get the songbooks out, and we would play every day after school. And the woman who ran that department thought we were cute, so she let us get away with it. And uh, mm-hmm. we could have been stealing hubcaps, I think, is what she thought. This was, th- <laughs> this was better for us. And uh, so I learned how to play guitar, and the minute I, I had uh, a grasp of chord changes, I started writing songs back then. None of them were any good, though. I didn't have any life experience yet to really put into songwriting, and that didn't happen until I was – in my 20s when the songs actually started to be about real relationships and and uh, and things like that what what was the first thing that you wrote that you rem- remember like feeling really good about and, and feeling like all right this this is something i wrote a song called houseboat about um you and me living in a houseboat you know with nothing to do and nobody to tell us what to do and eating when we're hungry and sleeping when we're tired and all that and uh it really it really was a i was i was shocked i actually wrote something that sounded like a song that was uh you know a legitimate song it was a big revelation and i was probably about 21 i think when i wrote that is that something you recorded i i don't recognize that title i recorded it once on a record i recorded in glasgow i made a record at the turn of the century <laughs> okay uh, 2000 uh 1999 <laughs> into 2000 in glasgow with members of teenage fan club and bell and sebastian and a record that kind of came and went, it was only available, it's probably my most 
obscure record, actually. And I recorded it with those guys, and it, it came out really good. Wow. I, I Yeah, I've never never heard of that collaboration, even. It, that's almost like a dream collaboration, too. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was funny, because I wasn't aware of who Bell and Sebastian were until afterwards. And then I would mention to people, yeah, there's these guys, Bell and Sebastian. They go, you recorded with them? Wow. I wasn't aware that they that they were popular. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, you do have a long line of uh, strange bedfellows of collaborators, and, and I'd like to get into that in a bit. But I guess tell me a little bit about playing with, with your friend after school, and, and then wh- when did you f- form your first real band? Well, I was in, in uh, garage bands all through high school, mm-hmm. and we would, play, we would play covers mostly. And uh, I was sort of uh, anachronistic in the sense that because Dwayne Eddy was my first love, I liked Dwayne Eddy before I liked the Beatles, you know. So uh, every garage band I was in, I always wanted to play Venture songs or, you know, Wipeout or Louie Louie and things like that, mm-hmm. which, which, you know, in the early 70s when the other – we would play Battle of the Bands and there would be at least three bands uh, wearing buckskin jackets doing uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And a, another band who was trying to be Santana and another band who was trying to be, uh, you know, Jethro Tull or something. And then we would play and we're playing Louie Louie. So it was always, uh, <laughs> I was always, I was pretty, I, I knew what I liked, you know, I knew what I liked and I, and I stayed true to it through the years. And it's kind of like, almost like learning how to speak Latin. Nobody wanted it. You know, there was no use for it. And it really didn't do me any good until, as far as, you know, my my style of guitar playing, which was surf oriented or Dwayne Eddy oriented, that really didn't have a place until Pulp Fiction came out, and all of a sudden, uh, that sound became considered edgy. Right. And uh, so, uh, most of my experience in bands was playing the wrong kind of music for an audience that really didn't want it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which you know, it didn't bug me that much, you know. It was, I, I knew what I liked and I knew what I wanted and I was kind of waiting for punk rock all the time. I didn't even know I was, I was waiting for punk rock, but when punk rock happened and, and it was back to three chords again, I was the happiest guy in the world. Well, when, when the Pulp Fiction thing hit, were you excited and were you, did you immediately see, all right, here's, here's an inroad for me or, you know, uh, the other reaction I imagine would be, oh man, like now everybody likes what I like. Oh, no, no. It was uh, amazing uh, because it's a big part of uh, the Instrumental Stylings record, which came out in 90, at the end of 94. Pulp Fiction came out in the summer of 94, and Glenn Morrow at Barnon Records, he heard some instrumental stuff that I had recorded, and he said, if, if you can uh, come up with a whole album of this stuff, I'll put it out. So I did, and at the same time, he had a music supervisor he had hired to pitch some of his stuff to films and TV and commercials. She heard my stuff and I had a meeting with her and she said, she was working on Pulp Fiction as a music supervisor and she said, if you move out to LA, I can get you work as a guitar player on sessions and probably as a composer too because once this movie breaks, everybody is gonna want this sound. And I believed her and I moved out to LA in January of 95 and she was right. All the standard composers, synth, synth composers and orchestral composers, were being pushed aside, and all these directors were were in wanting surf guitar or Link Ray or Dick Dale kind of sound and stuff. And there I was. Yeah. How how old were you at that moment when when you made that move? Uh, Thirty nine. I'd lived in New Jersey up until then, and I and I drove out in my nineteen sixty four Rambler. Wow. It was like the Grapes of Wrath. I had a boom box, a guitar, and, and some clothes, and I just drove across the country. I left uh, during uh, on, on New Year's Day, on a winter day, and drove across the country. When I landed in L.A., she got me a lot of work. I was I played on a lot of uh, movies that you might see at 3 o'clock in the morning on, on the movie channel, you know, <laughs> or, or, or HBO. I can't remember the names of the movies because I did a lot of work. But within three months, Third Rock from the Sun heard – an interview, the uh, the producer of Third Rock from the Sun, it was a pilot at the time. They, it wasn't a show on TV yet. They, uh, She heard me on the radio being interviewed. I was promoting 
the record and she called the station and had me come in for a meeting and I was hired on the spot. Ah, that's great. And Third Rock from the Sun, I became the composer for that show. And a really interesting thing about that is that the record business had basically written me off as being too weird to promote. Mm -hmm. Be because I'm all over the place as far as styles. And I sympathize with the record companies. I I'm not real rebellious about it or hating record companies. I, I really felt sorry for them because how do you describe what I do? I couldn't, I can't describe it. So how could they? And the irony is that the record business, even the alternative record business, thought I was too weird, but mainstream network television thought I was fine exactly the way I was. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So, but, you know, in the 80s, you, you were, you know, quite prolific. And, you know, when I think about rock in the 80s, I do feel like there was a fair degree of twang happening. You have, like, shadowy men on a shadow, shadowy planet and... I feel like the college rock circuit, there there was some twang in there. But uh, I, I don't know. Did you feel during the 80s like your career was – you were floundering or, or did – No, the, the 80s were good. I was a star on the rise. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> but um, I was supposed to be the next big thing because uh, Born in the USA came out which is a kind of a twangy record. Mm -hmm. John Fogarty made his comeback with Center Field, a very twangy record. So, And Steve Earle was big, you know, with, mm -hmm. it, with it, the, his first album. People were re really ready for a singer-songwriter who had that kind of, I guess they call it roots rock uh, sound. Right. And uh, I got a lot of attention in the beginning uh, as a songwriter. Marshall Crenshaw recorded one of my songs, which really helped a lot. All the record companies were interested, and I signed a deal and, and made records and went on the road. But it, it hit a wall, something about how easily I stray from one genre to another confused everyone. Mm -hmm. And it was my natural inclination to go that way. And, and many people told me to stick with one style and, um, and get a certain haircut as, as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I just couldn't do it. Went through several managers and uh, a few record labels, and um, I just wasn't, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess that I was really meant to be true to myself and, and what I really like to do. And I was used to being poor anyway, so it didn't really matter. Continuing to be poor, I had it down. Because right. when you become a musician, and this is, you know, probably advice for everyone listening right now, be prepared to be broke <laughs> because it really could be your fate so you need to really know how much you really love music you really need to know in your heart the truth about how much you love music because there are a lot of sacrifices you might have to make to stay true to that love right and i think it's almost like you know you really honed your chops and your tastes and when that attention came back to that sort of style you were there and you had been there all along and it was I don't know. It's, it seems like fortune or, or fate, you know? Well, yeah, uh, it, it is. And um, positioning yourself is re really important, too. You know, I went to L.A. Like, no one will hire you as a composer if you don't live in L.A. They're not going to do it. Because mm -hmm. they, want, they want to torture you in person every day, you know? <laughs> 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 and, which I found out real quick. But the every time you write a piece of music and get it out there, it's like you – you're buying a lottery ticket and it goes into the big bucket. And when somebody's looking for music, either for a TV commercial or a film, you never know when they reach in what what song or piece of music they're gonna pick out. It happened with me, there was a song that I put out in 1990 that became a Swatch commercial in Europe. And that, I, that actually was because I toured a lot in Europe and I played in Italy a lot and had a really good fan base in Italy. And one of the people who used to come see me play all the time ended up getting a, a, a big time job at an ad agency. So when they were putting a commercial together, he was thinking about me because he was a fan. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he placed a piece of my music to picture and everybody went nuts and they you know signed off on it. And that money that I got from that, I was able to move to the West Coast and uh, pursue film music with a little bit of operating capital in my pocket. Right. When I wrote that song and recorded that song, it came and went, and I thought, oh, well. Yeah. But no, there's a, there's a life. There's a life after the initial release or the initial inspiration of writing it. So it's good to finish ideas that you have, and it's good to get them out there. 
somehow. And, and how much of a stretch was it for you to adapt your career to say, okay, now I compose film and television music? It wasn't that much of an adaptation for me. One of the problems I had as a recording artist in, in, in a record business is you really only need about 12 songs every year and a half mm -hmm. to put out an album. So you're not writing really that much. You're not really required to write that much. You basically go on tour and portray the album every night after you release it. And I was more interested in the writing than I was in the touring or the fame or the attention or anything. For me, writing is is like what I think I really do. And there wasn't much opportunity to to write as a recording artist. I was kind of bored with it. It wasn't financially or you know commercially work, working out for, for me or the record companies anyway. And I wasn't that thrilled with the, um, uh, it wasn't challenging to me, I guess would be a, a good way to put it. And I wanted to see if I could write as a craftsman. I knew I was an artistic person, but I wanted to find out if I was a craftsman. Like if somebody said, we need a, you know, a, uh, an Argentinian tango by noon and it needs to be three minutes in length and it needs to, you know, be able to work with a scene with two people at a restaurant. I thought, man, that would be, that would be the greatest life to be leading where that's, a, that's your assignment when you wake up in the morning. You know? Is that what it's like? Definitely. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's great. And I wanted to be, I had a ro romantic image. I was a big fan of the Brill Building, all the people who wrote, Carol King and, you know, Neil Diamond, Neil Sedaka, all those people. They were in rooms with upright pianos and somebody would come in and say, we need a follow-up for Benny King. And they would write one and boom, they're in the studio and boom, it's out. And film composers and TV composers, it's even more intense because there's a, especially with TV, there's weekly delivery. If you're working in episodic television, it's weekly and it's, you know, when you write a piece of music, you can't have a second idea. There's no time for a second idea. Your first idea has to be the only idea because you need to record it and deliver it and move on to the next assignment, you know, the next piece of music, the next cue you have to write. And I really wanted that to try that lifestyle because I thought it would be challenging and it would be exciting and dramatic and I thought it would also force me to learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. And and did did it fit? Was it an immediate fit for you? It was. It was. I I loved it. I absolutely loved the pressure and the deadlines and uh, when Third Rock went on the air, it became a hit immediately and I ended up being offered a bunch of different shows and an agency uh, signed me. Uh, everything went legitimate immediately because I was on network TV. And I ended up doing a show called Men Behaving Badly for a season and a half. And then... That's the one with... Ken Marino was on that show, right? Yeah, he was. In yeah. The, in the, From the state. In the second season. Yeah. And then I did that 70s show. And so I was uh, under a lot of pressure. Uh, I, at one point, I was doing three TV shows at the same time. Wow. And, uh, and, I, and every, when pilot season came up, I would do five or six pilots. Wow. In the summer, my agent would try to get me to do a film in the summer, which I tried doing, but I, I preferred to have just a, a nervous breakdown every summer instead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just kind of kind of like sleep for maybe like five weeks straight or something. But it was really intense and it was, it was really exciting. And my restless energy as a composer and my curiosity a, about being creative all day was, um, was really satisfied. Right. It, was, it was great. So did you have anything to do with getting uh, In the Street to be the theme song for 70s show? Oh, definitely. Yeah? Definitely. That was, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was friends with Alex, Alex Chilton. He always told me he thought that song should have been a, a hit single. And I agree. It's yeah. got everything. I mean, it's got everything. All, almost you know? all of their songs should have been hit singles. Yeah, well, especially that one and When My Baby's Beside Me. Those songs are, you know, you don't have to even be... Uh, know anything about music to, to love that stuff mm -hmm. you know they're like they're like Beatles songs you know and uh, we were having a meeting where, for that 70s show we were having a meeting with a music supervisor about what would be the theme and I of course wanted wanted to write an original theme yeah but they said no what we what we really want is we want a song from the 70s so they were we had this it was it was a really funny meeting because it was the creators of the show and me and this grizzled music supervisor who has seen it all 
and he knows you can mention a song and he knows how much it will cost without having to look it up uh-huh. you know he's he, and so we're sitting there and uh, the creators of the show say we won't get fooled again he said you can't afford it <laughs> um he said uh, 18 by alice cooper never happened uh, uh young americans by bowie Please tell me you're kidding. You know, he was like, he should have been wearing a, a, a hangman's hood, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then we were, you know, we hit a wall. And I finally I said, um, does it have to be a famous song from the 70s or could it be a song from the 70s that should have been a hit? Because they wanted the kids to be in the car singing along to it because the creators of that 70s show, they wrote that scene in the Wayne's World movie where they're singing along to Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, okay. I never. Th- and they that just totally makes sense, but I never put those two together. Yeah, and they they were just crazy about the idea of teenagers singing along you know, at the top of their lungs to their favorite song on the radio. And so I said, "Can it be a song that should have been a hit?" And they said, "A song as long as the kids can sing along to it, and it's a great song, we, we don't care." And one of the writers who was working on the show was a big star fanatic. Mm-hmm. And so I said uh, to him, run down to your office real quick and, and grab uh, the big star CD and bring it back here. The, the, I, the one with yeah. the, the two CDs on one at the time, probably, right? Yeah, exactly. And I said, you know, and I queued up in the street and, I, and, and played it and everybody in the room said, that's beautiful, that's great. We love it, that's our theme. And the music supervisor said, well, the only way we can get this is if there's someone in this room who actually knows the person who wrote the song. Mm-hmm. And I said, hello. <laughs> I can call him right now if you want. I said, you know the guy who wrote this? I said, yeah, I can call him right now. So I called up Alex and I said, you know that song you think should have been a hit? Well, I think it's going to actually be a hit now, but you got to call your publisher and let them know that you want it to happen because we're shooting the scene in three days with the kids and it has to happen now. So uh, he called his publisher, and they worked out a deal, and and it was on the air. Wow. But it's cheap trick doing it, right? Uh, well, originally, the first season, it was a session singer that I hired, and I'm playing – I think I'm playing everything on that be, uh, except for drums. Uh-huh. Because the one, the one concern they had was they wanted it to be faster, and they thought that it needed to se- sound like – something from who's next hmm. as opposed to, you know, but one of the problems Big Star had is they sort of sounded like the birds. Right, you right. Know? They, they sounded like they were from the 60s more than the 70s. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to, it toughened up and a little bit faster. And, of course, uh, probably in a business sense, they wanted to own the master recording. Right, right. I'm sure that I'm sure that had something to do with it. And so I went into the studio real quick, and I actually went out to a bar – to, to see a band that my friend was playing in and, and the lead singer kind of sounded like Roger Daltrey. So I hired him on the spot and the next day we were in a studio and we cut the song and they, and they had the kids sing along to it and we were on the air. That's amazing. Was Alex happy about that? He was thrilled. I mean, I imagine him, him being a little contrarian sometimes. Uh, well, he, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> The joke about Alex is uh, he wouldn't like it if he liked it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, uh, no, he was thrilled. He was thrilled, and uh, and it worked out financially really well for him, which I was very happy about because, uh, you know, that song should have always been uh, well loved and well known. Right. So it worked out great on every level. It's a funny thing though because like if I play that at parties or not now, most people know it, but you know I remember like mid 2000s having a party and playing that song and people be like hey that's from that 70s show <laughs> be like no it was originally here here listen to this <laughs> yeah i know it's pretty funny because uh i remember rolling stone called me they were doing an article on uh that 70s show and they really wanted alex to be a uh, misunderstood broke artist Mm -hmm. and so they they were fishing around trying to find find some kind of angle where alex got ripped off (laughs) and it it, but it but it there was it it didn't exist it 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 didn't happen it happened in the opposite direction that he finally got paid for something but and the guy from rolling stone was so disappointed that's funny so disappointed (laughs) i couldn't give him what he wanted right 
I I was just always found it interesting that they have been painted as this tragic band who you know they never made it and stuff. But I remember I interviewed Jody Stevens once, and he was. I was just saying, well, you know what nobody talks about is how much did you tour? And he's like, oh, you know, we never toured. And it's like, well, obviously you <laughs> didn't, you know, reach the success that you deserve because you didn't put in the road miles. Yeah, two things that they shouldn't have done is uh, a lot of drugs. Yeah. And and uh, and not tour. I mean, that's that's a, a great way to go right into the cutout bin. Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, they're they're. Uh, Definitely, uh, they are to blame. Uh, but also, in their defense, Ardent Records, Stax Records was sold right right at the time that that record came out. So it fell through the cracks. No one really promoted mm-hmm. it properly. Mm-hmm. So how did your friendship with Alex begin? Uh, we had the same booking agent. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I actually met him, well, we did a lot of touring together. I would open for him. When, when he kind of came back, out, I guess we'll be like uh, around 87 and, and was touring a lot and had a new album out. I had an album out at the same time and we had the same booking agent and he put us on the road together and we played, I uh, mean, I don't know how many shows together, but it was like a lot. So we got to know each other really well because there's, you know, when you're on tour, it's uh, 23 hours of waiting and one hour of playing Yeah, every day. So it's a lot of waiting around, a lot of waiting around and a lot of boredom you know, potential boredom. So you make friendships uh, pretty easily just, you know, to kill time. And uh, Alex and I got along really well. He was a great guy to talk to music about. His taste in music were all over the place, and and, and so were mine. So we were uh, fast friends because of that, because we could talk about music for forever. Uh Uh-huh. How did that uh, collaboration with he and Alan Vega come about? That's that's, a... what what are your thoughts on that album you know 20 years in <laughs> <laughs> that album that album is uh i don't even know what kind of music i don't know, even know what we, i, I what, what what do you call that i don't know ha- hazy um, i don't I, know <laughs> yeah Muggy. i love the album <laughs> i love the album because it's uh it's something that doesn't happen in rock and roll that much it's kind of like a jazz album where you know, in the old days, they would have, you know, uh, Coltrane and Thelonious Monk and somebody else come in the studio together and play and leave. Right. <laughs> and maybe never play, and maybe never play together again. Um, a meeting of, of uh, musicians and recorded live with, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of improvisation. It, yeah. So it was and Alan Vega just improvising all those words? Yes. Wow. Every Every word is improvised. I met Alan, I was a big Suicide fan, and uh, but then he put out a, an album in 1980, a solo album that had a, a song called Jukebox Baby, which became my favorite thing in the whole world because it was the first time I realized that you can be in love with rockabilly but be a modern artist, which was important for me because that's where I was headed. Mm-hmm. I, didn't know how to, I didn't know how to do it, but I knew that's what... I wanted to do, but I thought it was impossible until I heard that record. So it was, it was a huge influence on me. So I uh, I met Alan around that time, and he was really interested in who I was. Uh, I, I probably went on and on about you know how great his solo album was, and he so he asked me if I was a musician, and I said yeah, and and he wrote down his address and said send me a tape of your stuff. And this is about 1981. Okay. So so I sent him a tape. And he called me on the phone, like, you know, a week later, and uh, was really enthusiastic about my music. And this is like the first outsider, really, you know, outside of my own uh, vacuum that I was working in. He flipped out over it, and um, he was being produced by Rick Ocasek at the time, and he, he tried to get Rick Ocasek to produce me, another Boston guy. Yep. <laughs> and uh, it didn't happen, but... Um, I stayed friends with Alan, and I always thought that even with Suicide, that what Alan really was at heart was a blues singer. Mm -hmm. And I I would always tell him that, and and I'd always say, we should get together sometime and do one of those Midnight Blues records. And he said, yeah, when our schedules are right, I would love to do that. And finally, and I guess it was 94, our schedules did come together, and I booked time at a studio in New York, and and Alan said, 
okay, I want to do this, but I don't want to have anything written for it, and I don't want you to even tell me w- what instrumentation you're bringing in. Uh-huh. I want n- no expectations. I want to be surprised by everything that we do. No expectations. We're not allowed to talk about anything. And I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've, ne- I've never worked like this before. And I was talking to Alex on the phone down in New Orleans, and I, and I told him, I said, I'm, you know, he was a big Alan Vega fan too, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be working with Alan Vega, but he, he doesn't want to talk about what we're going to do. He refuses to have any expectations whatsoever. And, and Alex said, um, I'm flying up. I want to be on this record. <laughs> this, 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 sounds, this sounds like the perfect way to work. And so I wasn't sure if I should tell Alan that Alex was coming up because that would have been information. Right. And I might have, you know, me, you know messed, messed his mind up too much. <laughs> but uh, they knew each other from the old CBGB's days. So it was, a, it was kind of a – they were reunited. And um, we got together for two nights and improvised everything. Yeah, are you guys the only musicians on that album, or are there other players? No, it's just us. Wow. So is there any overdubbing whatsoever? Just a little bit. Um, like, we would start off, like, there was Drum Machine. With Drum Machine, usually any song that had Drum Machine, we were all on it together with no overdubs. Okay. But um, on some songs, I played drums. So, uh, Alex would play guitar, and I would play drums, and Ellen would sing. And then one of us would add bass. Or maybe a piano part or something, but uh, no, it's pretty much, I would say, eighty-five percent live. Wow, that's great, that's awesome. Uh, do Do you think of that album as a high point? I'd imagine from collaborating with your heroes perspective, that must be like a nice a nice feather in your cap or, or something to look back on fondly. Yeah, well, it was uh, definitely a great experience. From me and we went out we played two live shows we played one show at the mercury lounge in new york and then we flew over to france and played a festival and the festival was insane because alex and i were we weren't aware alan vega was huge in france uh-huh but we but we weren't aware that there was an antagonistic uh relationship between or like a hostility between uh alan and the press and we did this or even in his his own audience i mean people were, were yelling heckling Alan during our set and he was you know heckling them back giving it right back to him but there was also this love in the room obvious love in the room at the same time it was a really strange relationship we had a press conference afterwards after our set we had a press conference and it was press from all over Europe it was a festival where everyone comes in and but the French journalists really went after Alan and they were calling him a dinosaur and all kinds of things wow and and he was yelling at him, and he, he actually um, uh, threatened to take to to go, take a guy outside and beat him up. <laughs> and um, and and Alex and I were looking at each other, going, "Oh my God!" You know. And then afterwards, Alan, in a real quiet voice, says, "Well, I think that went well." <laughs> <laughs> it was really a pretty amazing thing. Wow, I'm I'm guessing that's probably not even your craziest road story, though. Let me think about that for a second. Well, it'll come to me later. Okay. <laughs> I, it depends on it depends on which which one I'm willing to tell. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so so that album comes out, and then um, when when did that seventy show aired? What the two thousands? It's uh, no nineteen ninety seven through. It went on for eight seasons. So, oh. whatever that would be, yeah. So that was all around the same time with you're doing the. Uh, Alan Vega, Alex Chilton thing, and and uh, Third Rock, and yeah, that that must have been a crazy time for you. It was. I also uh, released a record I recorded in my Rambler that time too, Rambler sixty five. Right. There was. Uh, I wasn't playing live much though because I couldn't fit it in. Yeah. Could not. You know the 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 vortex of episodic TV is a really serious vortex. The thing about TV is you're on the air, you know, every Tuesday night or whatever. So when you finish a piece of music, you hand, you, you know, you hand it in, they take it right out of your hands and they put it on TV. Mm-hmm. So it isn't like a movie where they can push back the release date. And in the music business, they push back release dates all the time for albums. A lot of times it has to do with somebody's substance abuse problem, but you know, that's another <laughs> th- whole nother subject. <laughs> right. Uh, but, but not TV. TV, you're on the air. Yeah, 
And uh, so I couldn't really take time off and play much. I really needed to be there. Yeah. Well, with, with your writing, though, uh, it's interesting to me listening to your songs, the the ones with vocals, and they 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 seem very disciplined compared to. Well, I, I'd imagine writing for TV is disciplined also, but in a different way. But like the structure seems very much a priority. Well, it's it's uh, what I love. My favorite songwriters are people like Chuck Berry and uh, you know Roger Miller or. Um, you know, the Love and Spoonful, the mm-hmm. Kinks, and uh, very simple chord changes and economical lyric writing. You only say what you need to say and then kind of get out. Mm-hmm. Those are the people who inspired me. Hank Williams, you know, all the great writers. It's a short form. You know, writing a song is a short form. Right. And it's, there's, there's a, a beginning, a middle, and an end to every song that you write. And so I'm a fan of traditional chord structures. And even like the Kinks, I would say, is sort of traditional. They're yeah. you know artistic, uh, but they were still you know easy chord changes to play, uh, easy stuff for people to to get into right away. And it's never dawned on me on me to want to to write any lyrical songs that are complicated, really. So how did uh, how did you move on to doing production? By being p- badly produced by someone <laughs> and, and, and thinking I could do a better job. <laughs> the uh, first album I recorded, uh, we had, a, I'm not going to name the guy, um, okay. but he was, a, he was a big name and it was a, considered a real coup that I was in a studio, a high ticket studio in New York City with this guy as my producer. And he was like the worst motivator that, uh, that I've ever met. I mean, the way he got performances out of people or tried to was just completely wrong for a guy like me. And by the time the album was done, I was convinced that I I could have done a better job. And so I just started telling people I was a producer and I was, (laughs) you know, that's all you have to do is get a card printed up and say, record producer. Uh It's really, there is no actual schooling that, people don't check on your resume, you know, to see if you're legitimate. Uh, Because most people really want to be produced because they, uh, especially if they're bands, because de- bands are democracies and democracies are trouble. So sometimes you need an outside person to come in and say, no, that song shouldn't be on the album or that bass part maybe should change. If a band member says that to, a, to the bass player, they're going to be fighting probably. Yeah. <clears throat> or they're going to not fight, but they're going to resent each other without speaking about it, you know, which is, which is even worse. <laughs> right. And so... There were a lot of bands in the Philly area that were uh, cutting records, and uh, I produced, I kind of practiced by producing them. And then my second album, I produced myself. And uh, eventually, I got I got good at it. There was a guy at Electro Records, a guy named Danny Kahn, who ended up becoming my manager. He um, was in charge of uh, the American Explorer series, which was a series that Electra did in the early 90s. And they were the idea was they were going to make modern field recordings of older artists or folk artists who um, still existed but but should receive wider attention. And I suggested that Charlie Feathers, the rockabilly guy from Memphis, should be one of the artists. And, and uh, Danny said, uh, put together a proposal and you can produce it. So he turned me into a, a legitimate major label producer mm-hmm. just just from that conversation. And... I went down to Memphis and I met with Charlie Feathers and convinced him to sign a contract. We went into the studio. That would have been 1990, I think, 91 maybe. And from that point on, I had the the resume. I I, I love 12 golden country hits or what? 12 country greats, right? Golden country yeah. greats. Yeah, an album with 10 songs on it. By yeah. The way. Well, <laughs> I always thought, isn't it uh, the 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 musicians? Aren't there 12 of them? Yeah, that's what Mickey says. Yeah, I don't know. I never counted, but uh, that's a that's a good enough excuse for a title. You know, with Ween, why they do anything they do is is will forever be a mystery, not only to us but to themselves. Right, right. <laughs> you know, they're those guys are operating on a savant level. Uh, <laughs> they're amazing. I met those guys when they were teenagers uh, in New Jersey. They used to come out to the, to a club where I played, and they, and uh, and Mickey, who is Dean Ween. He had a radio show on uh, 
a college radio station there, even though he was still in high school. Mm-hmm. And so I knew those guys, and every now and then they would give me a cassette of, of what they were working on, and you know it was completely unlistenable. Uh, <laughs> like they would like, like like they would inhale helium and then sing a whole song. You know, yeah. it was just you know crazy stuff. And then all of a sudden, they got good, and. I became a huge fan. I lost track of them, and I, and I became a huge fan, and got to know them again. And uh, you know, I'm good friends with both of those guys. And when they wanted to do the country, I was in uh, Nashville for a while. Before I moved to LA to do film music, I was thinking that maybe Music Row in Nashville was a good place for my talent because of uh, lyric writing. So I spent about a half a year or a year in Nashville writing with people who had number one hit records, gold records on their walls. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever really came of it because I was a little, I think I was a little too uh, strange for them, you know, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I wrote with Rodney Crowell and the Ween guys. Now, those they're amazing because it, I remember the first time I hung out with them, they were living together in a house, and I looked at their record collection and it was Prince, Johnny Cash, Madonna, Deep Purple, you know, uh, John Coltrane. That was kind of like <laughs> their their record collection. And they were as deeply in love with that stuff. You know, there was no irony either. Like they would really like uh, some crazy pop record. And it was without irony. I mean, they really, uh, like Phil Collins, like the, the, the Phil Collins overproduced uh, 80s stuff. Uh, those guys genuinely loved because <laughs> I remember making fun of that stuff and they both looked at me confused. Like, why would you, they were, they were almost hurt, you know? <laughs> so uh, they, they were huge country fans and they came to me and said, um, we want to make a country record and we, and we want you to produce it. My first reaction was, which country? Because <laughs> with them, you never know. Right, right. And, and uh I said, well, the only way to do this is we, we really should go to Nashville and play with the top-notch guys who played on the Patsy Cline records and, you know, those records from that time period because they're still in the union and they're almost ready to retire. So it'd be really great to grab these guys right before their careers are, are done. I'm affiliated with BMI and um, Clay Bradley at BMI. He's the uh, grandson of Owen Bradley who owned Bradley's Barn. He helped me get uh, put it all together because he just knew knew everyone, and I got some amazing people like Pig Robbins on piano. That was a thrill to work with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he played on uh, so many records, but he also played on the Dylan records, like "On I Want You" by Dylan at that piano line, and he wrote that. I mean, that's you know, amazing stuff. And the drummer Buddy Harmon, uh, he's the guy playing drums on "Pretty Woman" by. Roy Orbison. Wow. And there we and there we were in the studio with those guys. So it was a it was really a great record to make. And the fact that Ween's songs were a little strange, it was uh it was really funny watching the musicians hear the lyrics through the headphones for the first time. <laughs> that was that was probably my favorite moment is like these weird smiles and one guy who was a real church going kind of guy frowned. <laughs> yeah. So what what do you spend most of your day doing now? I'm guessing did you have a moment when you burned out on the the television? Well, you know, it's interesting. I lost interest in in doing that stuff right around the time the production company I did most of my work for lost interest in sitcoms. What happened was um Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and and Survivor and all those kind of shows were now uh bumping sitcoms off the uh off the schedule, mm -hmm. uh, sitcoms were becoming less and less what what uh, TV viewers wanted. So the production company I worked for was called Carsey Werner, and they produced Third Rock from the Sun and that '70s show, and, but also Roseanne and shows before that, Sybil. And they started that with the Cosby Show, and they announced that they were going to shut down their production company and go out of business. And I thought, well, if they're going out of business, I should go out of business too. Uh -huh. Because obviously the, the landscape here is not healthy anymore. So I finished out uh, the final season of uh, that 70s show and decided to, to uh, not pursue it anymore. And 
it was a really smart decision on my part because probably for the last two years, I didn't feel like I could learn anything new. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of repetition from that point on. So it was really good for me to, to step away and not, not try to keep ha hacking away at it. And um, I went back to, uh, I, I didn't know exactly what to do with my my talent or my creativity or my love for music or anything other than to go back to my record collections, which is where I started. Mm -hmm. And a, a radio station in Memphis, WEVL, offered me a radio show. Uh, and they said I could record it in California and deliver it, and they would play it every Friday night at drive time. So I jumped on that opportunity because it, it reunited me with my record collection. I had to come up with playlists and it was the greatest thing to happen to me because I was back on my living room floor with a pile of albums, which is, you know, where it all started. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the show became a hit in Memphis and then WXPN in Philadelphia picked it up and now we're on 24 stations. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a weekly radio show. It's called The Many Moods of Ben Vaughn and it's freeform radio. I give a little, you know, back history to, I usually pick two or three songs that I can give musical history know backstory to and then the rest is just you know segues sequencing a radio show is uh it's really pretty amazing because you can almost create a suite even though you're maybe playing a merle haggard song after a stooges record there's <laughs> there, there's a thread that can be found <laughs> yeah yep i love though also how you go go full circle with the title of the show and the title of your first album on your own yeah exactly the many moods of ben vaughn which yeah uh, that title comes from um, when the Beach Boys were at their peak, uh, Brian's father, Murray, uh, oh, somehow convinced one, one of the best slash worst managers in history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he somehow convinced Capitol that part of the renegotiating the, the Beach Boys record deal was he needed to have a record deal too. Oh, right, so he, right. He, re he released an album called The Many Moods of Murray Wilson. Oh, man. <laughs> and... Uh, that was just too good. The Many Moods of Ben Vaughn just sounded <laughs> like, like uh, you know, I, I got to go with this. So my first album is called The Many Moods of Ben Vaughn, and, uh, and, it's, and it's also the perfect name for the radio show. It actually is the perfect name for the radio show because anytime a radio programmer says, wow, man, that playlist, you know, it's kind of schizophrenic, and I, and I just say, hello, the name of the show <laughs> is The Many Moods of Ben Vaughn. I right, feel, right. I mean, you, you knew this going in. <laughs> right. So you spend a lot of time doing that and also writing too, I'm guessing. This this is the Imitation Woodgrain and other folk songs is the latest. Yeah, it just came out. Tell me a little bit about the background of that album. Well, that's a that's probably the most immediate record I've ever done. I um, wrote and recorded those. I wrote all those songs within the last six months. Wow. And the minute I would finish a song, I, I have a gut string guitar that I'm really in love with and... Um, Every time I would pick the guitar up, a new song idea would come to me. The minute I was finished uh, writing a song, I would record it and then write another one. And I, I wrote 10 songs and recorded them. And um, I uh, put it out on my own label. I guess it's probably been three weeks. Three weeks. I guess three weeks ago it came out. That's great. That, I love the the immediacy of the modern age. It's the one, one good thing it has going for it with music is... Uh, you can just do something quick and turn it around and get it on available for everyone. Yeah, it's really great that, that artists are in control of their distribution now. It's hard because it's how to educate people or notify them that you actually exist and your, <laughs> album, it, your, your album is worth hearing <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is the thing that we haven't figured out yet uh, how to do successfully, you know, independently. Right, which is why there there are record promotion companies and people who work radio and everything. Yeah, but being able to actually get it out there, they can either post it on YouTube, get it on iTunes, or or, or wherever is. Uh, it is really really cool. Mm -hmm. What what song looking back do you feel represents you the most as far as because you you have such a a wide range and, and of styles and expressions. The one that seems to be larger than myself, I guess, I don't even know how to describe it, is a song called Too Sensitive for This World. It's a, it's a song I wrote right after a friend of mine died mm -hmm. uh, back, in, back in the 80s. And um, 
uh, people perform it. it. It's performed by other artists uh, more often than I'm just finding this out. Like, are you familiar with the band Deer Tick? Yeah, I love them. They're from Providence. Yeah, they're playing that song every night on stage right now. Oh, that's awesome. And they might record it for an album. That song is probably the deepest. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know what it is about that song, but it's it's uh, it, it feels to me like someone else wrote it almost. Mm-hmm. So that's probably my could be my most enduring one. Another one is I'm Sorry, But So Is Brenda Lee. Right, that's the Marshall, Marshall Crenshaw did that one. Yeah, yeah, people really seem to like that one. As far as my own, uh, I, I you know, uh, like like most artists will tell you, and this is going to sound like a cliche, but the next song I write is going to be my favorite one. Right, so. right. <laughs> no, it's a good. It's a, well, you know, cliches exist because they're true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, as a creative person, you're always excited about the next thing, and I don't listen to my old records. I never listen to my records. Uh, I would imagine most people don't because you're moving on to the next idea. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, as you know, when you're creative, curiosity is uh, is probably the motivating uh, uh, energy. Mm-hmm. Curious, curious about what you might hear next, which is the great thing about radio too. You 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 might hear your favorite song. You might think you know what your favorite song is, but you might hear something tomorrow, and that could change your opinion of that. Now there's a great takeaway. Keep on seeking. Whether you're writing, recording, or even just listening. Ben Vaughn's latest album, Imitation Woodgrain and Other Folk Songs, is out now. Special thanks today for editing assistance from Andrew Walls and to Gabriel Reifer Cohen for mastering this episode. And thanks, of course, to you for listening. Join us next month when our guest will be none other than Tanya Donnelly. And please, be sure to check out the Roaring Crowd Fund, Berkeley Online's brand new podcast coming this fall. Just search Roaring Crowd Fund on wherever you get your podcasts from. Listen to the trailer, subscribe, and fill out a review, because that's really the best way to spread the word. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon.